Hi, I would like to begin this episode by thanking some people, people like Kyle Wiswell, Philip Rotenberger, Sky, the author MC, and Julia. All of these are people who have gone to patreon.com slash duckfeedtv, kicked us a few bucks a month, and really helped support this network and this show and other shows like it. You can do that and get cool stuff in return by going to patreon.com slash duckfeedtv. My name is Gary Butterfield. My name is Cole Ross. And you're listening to Watch Out for Fireball's Dispatch, our monthly show where we answer your questions and read your responses. Yeah, we've got a lot of them. Uh, Gonna do like a bit of a heads up. In the last episode uh, on uh, Half-Life Alex, we kind of alluded to this episode uh, being kind of about VR and our experience with it. Uh, We talked a lot about that in the actual episode itself. Then we accidentally did a little mini dispatch yeah, uh, in there and, and talked about all that stuff. And I personally, I don't have a whole lot more to say mm-hmm. than that. Like I haven't, uh, we recorded that, you know, less than a week ago yes. and it's not like I have a, a body of VR experience I've gathered in the four days <laughs> uh, <laughs> since, since we recorded that. So like, you know, someday in the future, like as that sub medium evolves, Mm-hmm. Th- there might be more to talk about uh but this episode we're gonna do something we haven't done in a little while and do an oops all questions episode there was a problem at the factory many yep. souls were lost and all we got is questions <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep the molasses came and drowned people and then when they were uh rescued they were drowning questions mm. um it's the duck feed shirt waste factory fire again mm, tragic uh, so yeah, so we're just doing questions, uh, this week. We got a, a lot of them and, uh, we're keeping it light, uh, for things. I'm gonna go ahead and get us started here with Maya, uh, who asks, he's back. George Miller's sexual genie is here to grant another wish. This time Gary and Cole wished for a perfect game. Both of them could enjoy our toned genie produces a management sim, in which the player runs TSR just as the second edition of Dungeons and Dragons is released. The player must budget dwindling finances and larger-than-life personalities as they design source books, modules, and secondary products to stave off debt and a dreaded sale to those coastal wizards. <laughs> uh, and I actually, and parenthetical, I actually like the new D&D, though, too. Uh, will you foster a community of diehard grognards or drop an open game license to the delight of the creators of the Mr. Belvedere RPG <laughs> who finally have an open license to base some of their mechanics on? Come on, this would actually be a fun game if somebody who wasn't me made it. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, I, <laughs> I lost the question in that. I, yeah, I, uh, I did as well, uh, but I am, I'm, I'm not again it. No, no, that, that, that's a great idea. Um, this uh, uh, real quick shout out. Um, this is only tangentially related, um, but there's a series of books called, I think it's called uh, Dungeons and Designers. Okay. Um, that is decade by decade looking at the behind the scenes stories of tabletop RPG history. Hmm. Um, I have the eighties and nineties books, but there's a a seventies, eighties, nineties, and two thousands, uh, one. I think that they are published by black hat games. Okay. Uh, they're real cool. Nice. And, uh, you get all the kind of, uh, interior, like scuttlebutt on all of this stuff. So like, all about the Wizards of the Coast looking to buy it and what TSR was going through and how they expanded too fast and made too many complete bards. Uh, <laughs> you know, just a book just called Complete Bard. Yeah. Uh, how many How many of those can the market support? Uh, <laughs> Most parties can't even support one. <laughs> I know. The, the uh, what is this, Pathfinder? Uh, the, the um, yeah, so the, uh, I would like to do a shout out for those. And I think that sounds like a fun, cool game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, as for, I don't, I don't know like which of those choices I would make. It would depend on, you know, the, the, the market in the game. You know, yeah. It's uh, one of those obviously more forward looking, but if you're trying to stave off, uh, stave off acquisition, 
uh, you got to make sure that you're keeping your cash flow up and more grognards uh, yes. in the uh, in the 80s than there are people looking for, uh, you know, collaborative storytelling kind of things is my sense. Get them grognards in the mix. Yeah. In terms of a perfect game for for you and I, I feel like there's enough things that are really in the center of our Venn diagrams, mm-hmm. you know, as as is like we can invent one, but also like most of the modern Resident Evils are pretty dead yeah. center for the two of us. Mm-hmm. You know, RE2 Make is pretty dead center for the two of us, I think. Yeah, yeah. We uh, don't. In terms of <laughs> section. <laughs> it is it is more uh it is more at the extremes that are uh that our tastes died you know diverge right that's a pretty extreme too because like i like management sims yes you know like you like grognardy tabletop mm-hmm. stuff it's not even that's not even an extreme yeah like the extremes yeah. are like uh narrativeless roguelikes and visual novels right <laughs> you know and you'd think pyre then would be the perfect mm-hmm, mix mm-hmm, but mm-hmm, no mm-hmm. Abram no. says, uh, I'm not sure if you've touched on this before, but any uh, idea why game designers can uh, consistently couple horror with puzzles? Um, I've watched several streams, including Hexcrank, and the connection just feels odd to me. I think the obvious answer is to diffuse some of the tension uh, to keep the horror from uh, uh, overwhelming the senses. But why such a strong preference for puzzles? It feels a bit bizarre to be searching out the red key uh, when there's a bunch of undead virus monsters just around the corner, especially when I could just take the shotgun to the lock or kick down the door. If Chris can punch a boulder, shouldn't he be able to kick in a door? Any other weird genre ticks that stand out to you? I, I th- This never felt like it didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Um, and the reason why uh, is that you want to have some mechanics. Mm -hmm. Um, in your games, you want to have some stuff to break up the pace. Combat is too empowering usually. Mm -hmm. So that's not a good option. And video games are not that good at doing a lot of the other stuff. Yeah. That would happen. Um, you know, there are other systems that show up in horror, uh, but they're kind of rarer and I think they're harder to do. Yeah. Like the other one that, that shows up more now is, uh, survival stuff yes specifically you know uh babysitting your meters uh that kind of thing you know i think the actual answer to this is just the you know the the, the pedigree of the of the genre as well just like yeah, oh like inertia. Uh, yeah like alone in the dark game and you know capcom was like okay let's take let's take sweet home and alone in the dark and kind of do our our thing with that and was like oh alone in the dark was the way it was because of the people who made it right yeah <laughs> it was just the kind of stuff that they made uh so i think that uh you know it, it is that common that 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 common lineage but it's a good fit those games are good so yeah yeah and and i just i have a hard time thinking about what you would substitute it in there that is more true to true to the genre mm-hmm. you know like if you think about horror in other uh mediums there is a uh a really intense sense of kind of like predestination to them yeah, I guess like, you know, you go through the media, through the the motions, but you're doomed mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the time, like the, the, the fix is in. And that is very contrary to a game yeah. where you, the player input has to do something, mm-hmm. you know, uh, so it makes it makes a sense to me. Yeah, and uh, personally, puzzles are also really good at getting you to explore spaces as well, you know, like, OK, yes. I need to seek out the thing that goes in here. You know, I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna go search it, and you know, gotta move. have a reason to be there. Yeah, because because otherwise you you just leave. Uh huh. <laughs> you know, like it's it's the same. Like when I run, I've said this before, I think, but when I run Call of Cthulhu, one of the things I say to the players is like, when you make your characters, they have to be people who are curious, or they wouldn't be in the game. Like in real life, you could say, okay, fuck this shit, I'm gonna go back to school. Like mm-hmm. I'm gonna forget I saw all this stuff and go move in with my uncle and go back to school and get a yeah. post baccalaureate accounting certificate. <laughs> um, the uh, you have to play characters who wouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, you know, because that's that's what you do. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of like genre ticks, I'm gonna say uh, absolute garbage combat. Uh, in <laughs> the same, yeah. uh, there's literally no reason that there should be guns in say Deadly Premonition, mm-hmm. uh, and it actively was a huge detriment to my enjoyment of that game. Yeah. There's a boss fight with a wrestler and it sucked. <laughs> um yeah it shouldn't shouldn't have been there and was not speaking to the strengths yeah i would have yeah. rather had puzzles uh same no. i would have rather had puzzles and you know just more social stuff honestly yeah and like, oh, yeah. You, you walk around a, a fucked up place but no. yeah like a little bit more adventure game dna mm-hmm. you know to it i would have been yeah. better but yeah combat being shoehorned into horror games uh really grinds my gears mm-hmm. really burns my cannoli 
Yeah. Um, Most of my answers for this kind of get into things that are just kind of, you know, hoary cliches right now. So like, um, like uh, crafting us and everything, just like, no, you don't need to, you know, not everything needs to have shit that you pick up and turn into other stuff. Sometimes it's really good. uh, But, uh, you know, see Fallout 4, but like it needs a system built around it. So, yeah. And we've talked about crafting stuff before. Yeah. Uh, See, you know, for the opposite of that, see uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Mm hmm where you're just spending the entire game crouching and picking stuff up and it sucks. Yeah. Uh, or even, you know, uh, dragon age inquisition, mm-hmm. like the dumbest thing about that game, <laughs> um, which is already a dumbass fucking game. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ethan says, uh, I apologize if this been asked has been asked before, but since it's October, uh, I thought my question would fit to preface. I'm a huge scaredy cat. I hate jump scares. And most of all, I hate the feeling of being chased because of that. I can't play the vast majority of horror games. However, I love uh, the themes and concepts explored by the genre. Horror books and some movies don't bother me, but the immersion provided by games means that I often can't handle it. So I wanted to ask you guys, what are some good horror games that have little to no jump scares or chase sequences that instead rely on quiet, confident horror that lets you stew in its implications and terrifying imagery or ideas? A recent example of what I'm uh, trying to get at is in Elden Ring when you discover Godwin's remains. That ever-growing body of a soulless god is so striking, and the time it takes to reach the base of his body lets you, you let your imagination run wild. The moment doesn't rely on action. The tension is solely through imagery, the concept, and the story. Yeah. Um, yeah, so without jump scares is difficult because... Like, even uh, the th- best games throw in a couple of them, even to their detriment. Yes. Like, devotion is would be my answer, but it's like, well, just a couple little jump scares and, like, yeah, one little yeah. token chase sequence for really no good reason. Mm-hmm. There's just a a, a, a a schmear on them. That, and I think, like, jump scare stuff is is a little bit like, uh, like motion sickness, where there are people... <laughs> People have one word for it, but there are actually a bunch of different ways that it uh, that that it articulates. So it's very difficult for me to say like, oh, yeah, this doesn't have jump scares like Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth. Not really big on jump scares. Right. Yeah. Um, but like, I don't know. There's the, like there's there, there is stuff that you just like fall right onto that is pretty upsetting. You know, Ooh. things that immediately present as dangers that I do not see as jump scares, but other people might interpret it because I think there's a little bit of an elegance in the language. Well, Ethan also mentioned chase sequences, which yeah. makes this difficult because I was going to say like, oh, you know, Soma with the uh, monster turned off, mm-hmm. you know, and I think yeah. that there's no like that horror is probably based entirely not on jump scares. If you mm-hmm. turn off the monsters, um, yeah. I was going to say dark corners as well, but the best part of that, g- that game is a chase sequence. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it's pretty tricky. Um I'm looking you know, at <laughs> I'm I'm looking at lists of games that say they don't have jump scares, but like I don't know. Uh, they've got <laughs> they've got Silent Hill, 2, Silent Hill Two on there. There are jump scares there. They have stories untold. There are jump star- jump scares there. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm just kind of trying to outsource this um, I, I, to a degree. I, I feel like Ethan, like the 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 real answer is that it's going to be very difficult to find zero. Mm-hmm. Uh, what might be a more realistic compromise is to try to find few yes you know and in that case i would say like soma and devotion would be good good answers that deal with horror that is about other stuff uh and at least keep a a, you know a tight rein on that shit yeah uh you could also go lower fi um a world of horror uh like there's a roguelike element to it but you are just basically running a miniature campaign that is like a junji ito short uh Mm -hmm. each time uh, and you see cool monochrome art, uh, that doesn't, you know, just the presentation is not really like set up to jump scare you. Uh, mm. there is corpse party, uh, emulate the PSP one because any of the remakes have just poisonous art and uh, voiceover. The PSP one is actually, is actually good. Uh, so gotcha. emulate that if you get a chance. Yeah. So you can go like lower fi and, uh, put, you know, pull in something like, uh, you know, stuff made in, you know, older RPG maker kind of stuff. Yeah, the uh, yeah the the, the remakes uh, art on that game is pretty rough. Yep. <laughs> uh, every 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 time I'd seen a commercial for it, I was like, oh, you know, people like this game, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's all just dead eyed waifus standing around wearing yeah. identical clothing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, upsetting, sad. <laughs> uh, oh. Cody says, 
Uh, listening to the Chican episode of Abject Suffering, or sorry, Exquisite Suffering, I was really intrigued by the way that game encapsulated a moment in time uh, mentioned as comics were looking for the next spawn. I immediately understood exactly what Gary meant when he said that. Uh, it got me thinking, what kinds of narrow particular aesthetics would you like to see uh, come to a video game space? Personally, uh, I think it would be cool to see a game where the graphics capture the vintage CGI look of mainframe entertainment, reboot, Beast Wars, Shadow Raiders, etc. I can't get with you on that last one. <laughs> yeah, I, I much respect. There, there's an age difference thing, I think, that happens uh -huh. with reboot, uh, where when they came out for me, they looked like absolute poison. Uh huh. Uh, to me, those are things, and again, this is all purely subjective. There's absolutely no judgment. Uh, those are some that's some of the worst aesthetic. <laughs> to me like i i just really have always hated how those things looked yeah um but it is very it's a good example because it's very narrow casted yes you know it was it was a it was a time mm -hmm. uh that existed that's a good question i don't you know i don't know uh thinking like what are some really narrow casted aesthetic things that have died that haven't already kind of come back mm -hmm. because we're in the middle of the ps1 you know surge I'm bringing yeah. that back. We're getting uh, also the early kind of source engine boomer shooter, you know, come back like blood and games like that are being kind of held up again yeah. and being used as influences. So it's kind of, it's pretty tricky, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, the things that I would want to have do this that are, have been narrow casted are now back yeah, and are no longer narrow. Um, you know? I don't know with the recent re release of Pentiment and kind of thinking about like just way you know pre video game aesthetics that maybe you could bring in and, and base a game about. What I want is a game that uh, pulls from the aesthetics and storytelling style of Fletcher Hanks. Hmm. Yeah, that'd be great. That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah, um, just just really shitty, just made by an absolute just horrible drunk in the 1930s for pennies. Who froze that shit? Yeah. <laughs> He froze to death on a park bench. They say it's yeah. like going to sleep. He died the, like Edgar Allan Poe did. Yeah. <laughs> Will his impact be the same? <laughs> uh, one of the things that I'm going to say, I don't think that this is, because uh, there's just one game I can think of that did it. Uh -huh. um, I would like more games in the indie space specifically to do what Faith does. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is two things. Like one, like that kind of brings back two little used aesthetics. Yes. Like the the very old Atari and then the rotoscoped animation. Mm -hmm. um rotoscoping is my maybe my answer like digital pixely rotoscoping mm -hmm. yeah. i agree it's uh it's really good uh it's it's very short if you like that aesthetic i'm speaking generally because recommendations mm -hmm. are poison i believe i also recommended this to you on slack uh horror of salazar house um does Ooh, yeah. real similar kind of deal uh while being a uh, like a dungeon crawler um uh gosh what is it deja vu style uh you know uninvited kind of thing that yep. kind of thing is coming back as well um i bought uh or it was free i didn't didn't buy it but there was a game called the shadow people that i saw in that six second trailer mm -hmm. twitter that is also is similar yeah. to that uh, i haven't played it yet um mm -hmm. so i don't know if it's any good but yeah yeah that's coming back in a cool way yeah uh as well the uninvited angle uh, okay. along with that angle so yeah it's all good stuff to me uh, enjoy that. Uh, Greg says, uh, with the just released Atari 50th anniversary collection, we finally saw the first official release of Jaguar games in an emulator for modern systems, including the awesome Tempest 2000. What system or games would you most love to see re-released on a modern system? Um, oh man. Uh, yeah, fun question. I, the, th the thing that would be the, the, what I want uh, for this, it never happened, but what I would have really, uh, the, you know, the moment has passed. But uh, during 3DS, I would wanted a big Virtual Boy collection pretty bad. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you do the 3D. Uh, you know, Nintendo owns it. Yeah. See, it seems like a no-brainer to me, except nobody would buy it. Right. Uh, you know, so that's the, that's the bad <laughs> thing. But I would love that just because it's an excuse for, uh, you know, a, a system that I didn't play very much of. But it's still a Nintendo first-party system, so I know there's a bare minimum of quality. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure there's gems there. Yeah. Um, I would like to see um, uh, an easy way to play um, old, like like specifically Macintosh games. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like you get that. I, I, have, I have that Bitmap Books uh, collection book about the like the the history of Mac gaming. Gaming in and, the Mac prison. 
Yeah, and like yeah. the you know the joke is, lol, they don't have games. No, they have really weird games that look pretty cool that I would like to play around with, and uh, kind of seems really difficult to impossible to emulate. Uh, and it, yeah. it would be nice to actually get like a uh, something uh, put together out of that. Yeah, that's a good answer as well. I basically any of those old things I would like to have curated. Uh, you know, I'm way I'm I haven't got it yet, but I'm way into the Atari collection. Mm-hmm. Uh, largely because of Jaguar and Lynx stuff being on there. Yeah. Um, that's exciting to me, even if they're garbage, 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 <laughs> garbage games. Yeah. Uh, I just, yeah, give me that shit. What's needed for those is context and they provide the context. I'm very, uh, I'm very excited to dig into that. Me too. Yeah. Just, uh, just behind no work play, but it's on, it's on my list. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, uh, Chapel says, uh, Gary said once that Dragon's Dogma is the worst game that he likes, which is a very funny way to categorize things to me. Gary, is it still the worst game that you like? Cole, uh, what is the worst game that you like? I, I don't know if it's still the worst game that I like. I, I, it, it is in many ways a bad game, mm-hmm. uh, that I still had fun with. Um, there are a lot of problems with that, not just the obvious ones that people talk about. Like, I think people are generally with me in that the script and writing in that game are bad. Yeah. Uh, the, the combat in it is an illusion, (laughs) you know, like it's a, it's a magic trick being pulled on you. Like it's fun, but it's not, it's real shallow in terms of like what the numbers are doing. Like it's not very satisfying in that respect it, it's shallow um, but they also just completely overload you with mmo style like move move variants that fill up yeah your, uh, yeah yeah that, that just kind of barely matter like it, it's it's a weird fucking game you you go through really empty space like it's a huge open world where like if you go off the beaten path your best reward is clearing a dungeon before you're supposed to do it so it has the wrong stuff in it mm-hmm. and is empty or it, it has no treasure at the end or any boss yeah like it's it's got so many fucking problems. It just as a gestalt ended up being really fun. Yeah. I don't know if it's still, but it's a really good example of like this game is actually kind of dog shit, but <laughs> it is I do like it. It's real fun. Yeah. So um this is a tough answer uh for me. Um just because I I, I don't Survival know. Survival horror games are the, the bad. Well, yes, they're they're yeah, they're full of that. So let's yeah, let's yeah. say uh rule of rose. It's it's yeah. an unpleasant game that is very very difficult to play. That is still I think worth your time if you um have you know, it's worth your time with one of the big, biggest asterisks that has ever been. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, Lucky uh, says Viva Contact. Can you answer for me these questions? Three, one. Uh, Gary mentioned X Men Two: The Clone Wars in a possibly old episode I listened to recently. I was reminded of how I always felt the soundtrack uh, for that game got no love forever or whatsoever on OC Remix. Are the games whose soundtrack you think deserves far more recognition? Uh, well, let's go through these one by one. Yeah, I don't remember. Um, um, I I wish that uh, you know uh, this is a soundtrack that people tend to enjoy, but it doesn't even come up that often in um, discussions of like indie uh soundtracks let alone people listening to completely identical assassin's creed soundtracks all over you know over and over again um i'm gonna say uh machinarium no yeah i'm a uh recognition is the hard part for me in this because i don't spend time on oc remix or anything yes so i don't know if it actually has recognition just in terms of anecdotally like people talking about it i'm gonna say fantasy star 2 mm, yeah um question number two uh, this also prompted me to see if you had ever covered X-Men 2, The Clone Wars, and I wasn't able to find any such episode on the public feed. Can you confirm that you haven't covered this game? We have not <laughs> covered that game. Confirmed. Yep. <laughs> uh, three, much love for Days of Future cast. Is the story that serves as the backdrop for X-Men 2, The Clone Wars, worth reading in the comics? Uh, wow, what a question. Uh, the story in The Clone Wars is vaguely based on the Phalanx Covenant, if I recall. Uh, the answer to that is like a definitive no. Uh, it's a mid nineties, big X-Men crossover. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have some affection for it because I read it as a teen. Yeah. It is not one of the ones I think that holds up, uh, really at all. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to say big, 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 no, um, in turn. Yeah. Uh, not worth your time. If you are already nineties X-Men pilled. Uh, specifically the mid to late nineties, like Scott Lobdell <laughs> era, which is like really fucking rough. Like I, yeah, I cannot, yeah. you cannot do not have to hand it to him. It's hard to go back to. If you are already affectionate to that and like, say you really love generation X, 
uh, that book because it launched out of the Phalanx Covenant, you might find some joy there. Okay. But uh, I'm going to say save your time, personally. You know what? I'm um, going to say run, don't walk. <laughs> Cole's answer is, you know, it sounds pretty good, man. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you, you, like I, man, I the 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 absolute goblin's curse I would put you under. I was like, hey, Cole, we're, we're covering the Phalanx Covenant now. I don't know, unfilmable. Who gives a shit? Deal with it. Uh, and then you just have to read the Phalanx Covenant. Yeah, God, it's like real, uh, real torture porn. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, PS, uh, according to the high precision scale, uh, I love you both equally. Also equally to Jeremy Greer. Yeah, I'm sure Jeremy appreciates it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's see here. Nicholas writes, uh, I've been working a lot lately, which causes me to fantasize about playing video games uh, when I do get free time. When it actually happens, though, I feel a sense of ennui and don't actually feel like playing anything. What do you guys do or play to get over that feeling? Man, if you have an answer for me, I would love to hear it. <laughs> yeah, I, to I totally get that feeling. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, typically what happens is other parts of my life are impacting me and I'm not really considering it. Like I'm yeah. tired, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it just, uh, so like recently I'm kind of behind on work play. I have a lot of scrambling to do and, uh, my fiance moved in mm -hmm. and it's great. It's been wonderful, but I'm like, why am I tired all the time? Why am I like distracted? Like, why do I not want to spend time doing this. And it's because I want to spend time hanging out with my fiance, yeah. doing the house together. Um, I don't know how to get past that other than just like forcing myself to do it, yeah. but it's my job. So I have to force myself to do it. Mm -hmm. My advice for somebody who, you know, video games are just like a release, like don't force yourself. Yeah. Um, these periods go come and go. I find, mm -hmm. um, do whatever sounds good in terms of self care because you are, you know, recovering from work. Uh, and then video games will come, will be there when you need them. Yeah. Uh, I know definitively the answer is not buy more games. Uh, yes. Even though that can emulate the feeling mm -hmm. of playing a video game. Yeah. Uh, it's not. <laughs> so <laughs> just going to throw that pro tip out there for you. That is a, that is a very good, uh, pro tip. Yeah. No. Uh, um, what uh, does this Nat is, say? this is me. Nat says, uh, so I've recently been playing final fantasy tactics, a two and paired with the news of the thoroughly unique battle, uh, Mega Man battle network games, getting a switch re-release. I've been thinking about dead end franchise branches. Do you have any favorite, uh, franchise offshoots you'd love to see get more attention? Uh, it's a cheat, but you know, final fantasy tactics is one. Yeah, for yeah. me, every time Square tries to do something along those lines, uh, they <laughs> fuck it up really badly, and they forgot how to make charming characters. Right, right. Uh, entirely. Yeah. Uh, so that sucks. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Man, it, one. It, it'd be pretty cool to get like a modern, like a modern game that had the um, uh, kind of aesthetic and feel of a Mega Man Legends. Like, yeah. just pu pull it, pulling from their for, from their question itself, like. You know, those are really rough to go back to because of the you know time period that they came out. But like, take take the take the charming stuff from that and put a good game under it. Shit, man! It yeah. would be uh, third times a charm. <laughs> They'll finally make a good game of this. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, this I I guess like this is this is only kind of an answer. I would love like uh, you know I I don't I do not like the Mega Man Battle Network uh, mm -hmm. video game series of video games. But I would like a Mega Man, like what Mega Man X did to Mega Man. Mm -hmm. I would love to have happen again. Yes. Like get rid of all of the lore, uh, streamline all of the mechanics and just give me like a really, really good Mega Man. Yeah. So, which isn't you know exactly an answer, but like Mega Man X again, you know, but not <laughs> Mega Man X 10 or whatever the next one is in the series. Right. Mega Man Y or whatever <laughs> they already did make them in i mean they did zero or whatever it is yeah yeah i don't i don't want that either no and then Mega Man powered up wasn't it no. either like that's that's a hard hard one so like yeah i would love to just play a straight up fucking Mega Man game mm -hmm. that'd be cool yeah agreed yeah. uh 
let's see. Phil says, uh, in a recent replay of Disco Elysium, I was surprised that um, on initially inspecting the hanging body, Kim tells me to go to a store to get some ammonia. Uh, this got me thinking about the MacGuffin in narrative gaming. Nine times out of ten, uh, when I go to a new area only to find an NPC to tell me to go find a thing, or worse, multiple things, in order to progress, I roll my eyes and tune out. Uh, most of the time, the thing you are uh, collecting has no bearing on the quest or side quest. Uh, it's just a tally mark to flag progress. Uh, but sometimes it works. For me, the, the Disco Elysium example doesn't bug me, or didn't bug me, uh, because it was a mechanism to teach the player about white checks. Uh, and it makes sense within the larger narrative. I'm struggling to come up with other good gaming MacGuffins. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on uh, MacGuffins as narrative crutches? What are some other examples of item fetching that has worked for you? Why do you think they work? Yeah, I, I uh, my, for some reason, my, my brain is resisting the term MacGuffin yeah. for this, just because I think of a MacGuffin as being more important. It's the Maltese Falcon. Like, just, yeah. it doesn't matter what it is. It, you just know that a bunch of people want it and that desire draw, that desire drives the narrative, right? Yeah. Dry, like where these are, these are more like little miniature uh, things, but you're not wrong, Phil, in that like video games are con, you know, I need to go clear out the basement. When you get to the basement, they got bad news about the attic. <laughs> like, it's, uh, that stuff's really fucking obnoxious. Mm -hmm. And once you notice it, you can't not notice it. That's the thing. Like it happens in good games too. It's all over Alex, mm -hmm. uh, Half-Life Alex, which we just did, which is a good game and is made by people who are consummate professionals who are usually really good at disguising that shit. But like, yeah. oh, there's a backup uh, <laughs> thing to hold it up. Like just go to hell. <laughs> you know, uh, that shit is, is really obnoxious. Control is one of the worst offenders for that in recent memory. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thing. Um, to me, it's not so much that there are good ones as it's good when they burn off. Right. Uh, early on when it's teaching you something or getting you to go to an important area, mm -hmm. uh, that's fine. Um, but then it has to, you know, it's like teaching a kid to ride a bike where like you're, you know, holding their shoulders, then you let go and they don't know that you let go. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, some games just never do that. Right. Um, they, you, they should do that. They should let go of your shoulders mm -hmm. um, and just be like, you know, I'm going to explore because now I'm wrapped up in the conceit yeah. and, and the narrative and I'm having intrinsic fun. I don't need, you know, a, a guy to tell me to go get some power converters or some bullshit. <laughs> like I, I, I need to power that up. So I'm going to, you know, deduce for myself where I'm likely, you know, to get those. And then I'm going yeah. to see other problems to solve on the way there. And it's going to cascade out naturally without, uh, I mean, being presented as a, as, as something on an outline, right. i you know, yeah. or a fl flow chart, right. A linear series of people saying not yet. Yes to you like that is what is one of the most irritating things a game can do to me now yeah. and it's just i wish i'd never seen it i wish <laughs> i never noticed it because it, it's really hard not to see for i mean uh, for 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 me like theming actually helped that for a while so like i used to hold up dead space as a really good example of how to do this because mm -hmm. like oh you are on a spaceship uh, that is falling apart because of this, you know, that just, it's not being maintained. You have this invading force that is taking over everything about it. So it makes sense that like when you try to go to this place, oh, the tram is down. So you have to go fix this. But when you get there, all right, well, that part is over there. Like at the time that felt like it was enough. And now mm -hmm. it's and and now it just feels I mean, even back when we played it for the show, it just it just felt egregious in terms of like, well, oh, well, yeah, they're just doing the Tomb Raider thing. Get 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 three things to advance. Here you go. Yeah, I just I I, I like there needs to be like a better way to structure games. And I understand a little bit of why they're going uh, about why they do it that way, because they want to communicate clearly like what the parameters are to get past this, but like yeah. it needs to be, to not be so transparent. It really needs to be not so transparent. It, it's got to, it in games that can change venue more often. Yeah. It tends not to be as big a problem. So I was thinking about how like that same kind of outlining is what happens in the best adventure games, right? Yeah. Like you go up to a character and he's like, I need these three things. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are your three like Omni puzzles to solve. But then when you get there, he doesn't go, okay, but now you need, this, this, and this, you just go to a new zone. Mm -hmm. You've succeeded in the goal and you move on to a new paradigm yeah. kind of thing. And that makes a big difference. Or um, I was thinking about like, say like the Witcher 
where uh, in an individual quest, this happens extremely rarely. Mm-hmm. But generally, you go get you know the power converters or whatever the thing is, and there's not somebody there who's like, there's bad news about uh, the power converters. You need the power couplers first. Mm-hmm. You've just com- you've done that thing, and now it's time to do another thing. Yeah, they're not connected. Like when it, when a game takes place over a wider space, you run into this a lot less. Yeah, it's it's a narrative linear game uh, that does this. You know, it happened in the Evil Within too. <laughs> like if, if a game, if you're you're going through a plot, this is the way that video game designers have decided to funnel you through a plot. Do you want to know what game? I mean, just to bring back something we talked about in this very episode. Do you want to you want to know what game does a really really good job at this? What is that? Resident Evil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I mean even like even the remake something a little bit more modern but like all right well I need these four masks. Cool. All right. And to get those four masks I need you, these keys. I need these emblems. I need the <laughs> Well the, the trick with those is like each one is not just going to a space. Right. Like you know getting the mask is behind a boss fight or a major series of puzzles or a really mm-hmm. interesting encounter. Oh, so uh, the trick is just do cool shit. <laughs> the trick I mean I, I, it's very Gary Butterfield cliche. It matters what you're doing in a video game, you know, like doing cool stuff always matters. And like getting to the director to report to them in control and having them be like, oh man, you've turned on the elevators, but we still need to grab the daylight savings converter before they can work or whatever. Mm -hmm. Just feels bad. You're still just doing control ass shit. Yeah. You know, it doesn't really, it matters less what's happening here. If you were continu- continuously doing cool shit, you'd be doing anyway. Yeah. You know? And um, with Disco Elysium, like, yes, A, you can get around it by having the right stat for that, you know, to overcome yeah. the the smell of the body. But it, that is, that is specifically uh, A, guiding you to a place that is rich with other like side stuff to do, you know, the stores and stuff. Yeah. Um, but, um, that just, that, that's what the game is. It's, it's, it's an investigation. You're going to be running across pertinent details and interesting yep. problems along the way. Well, and it has to, that's very early in the game where it has to teach you like, Hey, this is one of the richest video game worlds ever created. Yeah. You want to go talk to everybody. Yes. You know, it has to, it, it doesn't ask you to take that on faith, mm-hmm. which is really good. Yeah. Uh, is this, uh, this is me. This uh, is you. Lucky says the morning after searching for into the breach on Google, on the Google play store, I was shocked to see Netflix listed as a publisher. Apparently Netflix is adding mobile games to the, uh, things you get with their subscription service. What is your take on this? Uh, fine. Um, yeah, d- Netflix like, is a, a bad company and B incredibly terrible about communicating anything about their products. So I want to say I'm glad, you know, I'm I'm happy whenever it, like an independent developer gets money, you know, if they can find sure. a pay a pay pig like Netflix to give them money to put that stuff out, um, as long as it doesn't end up being in a walled garden like you need the Netflix uh, arcade app to you know to play this or whatever. But like Netflix, they just it, it's confusing. Like they say, okay, play play into the breach on Netflix. Well, what does that mean? I talk about yeah. this stuff for a living and I have no idea what that means. I, I don't know either. And it's the only big game that did that. And you can still play into the breach. Like, you know, that at the same time this happened, it was also pushed on my phone, mm-hmm. you know, and the, the copy of it I have on switch still works and has the update and stuff. Yeah. Th- this felt like a big, uh, nothing to me when yes. it came out. I'm not saying that to rebuke lucky for answering, asking the question. I just like basically forgot about it because yeah. it feels like it didn't make any impact. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, I want to say like, yeah, good. Fuck them. And then, but then Netflix puts out a lot of stuff I really love. Sure. So I want them to stick around, <laughs> but I also <laughs> wish that they would just chill. Yeah. Uh, Ironically. You know. Yeah. I, yeah, exactly. Netflix. <laughs> Please comma, chill. Chill. <laughs> uh, you know, and that's basically what I want of all services is to stop changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, just be the thing I like and stop. Please. You know, you you don't you can't make any more money. There's no more blood to get from the stone. Just hang out. Yep. Vibe. We're all gonna die. Just vibe. And they'll <laughs> never do it. It sucks. Every single service that you love will continuously mutate and change and get worse mm. the entire time you're alive. Yep. Uh, somebody it fucking will, sucks. Somebody will buy it and want to recoup their investment, and then they will try and change it. They'll do shitty things to acquire more users, overextend themselves, the core service will break, and yeah. It's uh, yeah. it is, we, we are in this crazy death spiral now. I have it's never a felt a sad story, but we have to tell it. <laughs> yeah. I, I have, I have never felt more disenchanted 
uh with uh, with tech and that is really like that is a staggering thing for me to say because i already thought it was fucking bullshit yeah it's <laughs> it's a nonsense uh it is you know new, who thought the end of the world would be this boring yeah uh moving on to a different question type here we're going to go down to media questions ethan writes Hello, guys. I used to be uh, obsessed with the universe of A Song of Ice and Fire slash Game of Thrones. I watched each season of the show multiple times, read the available books multiple times, and consumed all of the supplementary material. The love I had for the series faded with the wretched last season of the show and the realization that I will never be able to read the complete book series. However, the House of the Dragon has completely pulled me back into the universe. Uh, I've even been watching lore discussion videos for the series, which I haven't done since I was in high school. So do you guys have any media franchise that you fell out of love with only to be pulled right back in because of an amazing new entry in the series? Uh, that is a good question. Yeah. Uh, for me personally, it just like, I do fall out of love with stuff or go in a period of remission and then come back to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it typically has not happened because of an amazing new entry in the series. Um, the one example where it kind of has is like the, you know, better call Saul coming back and finishing, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I didn't like stop liking breaking bad. I just mm -hmm. went back to thinking about it more. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, it's not as dramatic as this, um, you know, with game of Thrones to uh, house of the dragon for me. And when it yeah. happens, a lot of times it's just kind of arbitrary. Like I'm like, Oh yeah that hmm. oh, yeah, and then good. i'll just spend some time revisiting that yeah um i mean better call it's funny that you bring up better call Saul because i watched like the first season of it and then just kind of stopped mm -hmm. because of you know like oh i'm not going to watch it live because i don't have cable and it just didn't didn't really grab me and then yeah. something you know uh, uh, you know what you know what it was uh bob odenkirk uh having his um his heart attack Mm. Um, it made me like, well, I have to watch this now <laughs> because <laughs> I realized what we might lose. And I knew like, <laughs> just yeah. that, that, that like put it back into my head. Uh, obviously the show continued to, to just get better and better, but there was yes. no like straight up and in, in, inciting, inciting thing where it's like, Oh, oh it meets back on the menu. Now Jimmy's back on the yeah. menu. Yeah. 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 The, uh, yeah, I yeah, I don't I don't have a good answer for just being pulled back in by a, a specific thing. Like, yeah, like I uh, I also got I I didn't finish the the fourth book because I thought it was boring, but I mm -hmm. had a similar obsessive streak with A Song of Ice and Fire and and more specifically the show mm -hmm. and stuff, and like watched a bunch of you know YouTube videos and lore videos and stuff like that uh, to have on in the background. You know, we all like trash YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, and what will happen is sometimes I'll just be looking for something to have on in the background while I clean the house. Uh, and I'm like, oh yeah, I haven't listened to those, that in like three years. And I'll just, I'll get back into it that way yeah. and just like run through alt shift X or, or any of those guys, uh, all the way through. Yeah. So, uh, James says, hello boys from not so sunny London, a uh, quick and simple media question for me, aside from games for work, uh, and what you covered for unfilmable, what spooky media did you consume for Halloween? A shout out to Cole for his Halloween reading episode. What a great idea. And surely a lucrative career in audiobook reading beckons. A lot of people said that. A, thank you. You're way too kind. Uh, also, no, it doesn't. <laughs> you do not yeah, make money it, doing that. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a way to people who make, uh, you know, $5 an hour uh, <laughs> yeah. do that. It's actually a weirdly, like, incredibly exploitive thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, it's a, uh, so it's, it's a nice thought, but, uh, I will continue, uh, doing my kind of talking, uh, yeah. for, for, for a job instead of that kind of talking. Um, I'm pretty much always watching spooky stuff in horror movies, you know? So like mm -hmm. Halloween was not a, was not like a real, you know, outlier for me in that regard. So like I watched a good spooky stuff during October, like I watched Daniel isn't real. That's good. That'll probably be on, uh, unfilmable at some point here um uh watched barbarian that's really mm -hmm. good yeah no just to just continue in a pace because i love i love horror yeah same, same i don't i don't didn't do anything special for october i originally was going to try to do like a shock tour like scare a day mm -hmm. kind of thing and then i just ran out yeah. of steam and got busy and then i was like i don't have to be beholden to any months uh-huh um yeah uh in terms of spooky media uh shout out stuff 
Um, I, I'll, I'll second the Barbarian. Barbarian was real good. Uh, me and Liv have started watching the Guillermo del Toro Cabinet of Curiosities. Okay. Anthology. Uh, like first episode's like a B, second episode's like a C minus, and then the third episode knocks it out of the fucking park. <laughs> uh, incredibly good. Yeah. So that that's uh, worth time. Uh, the uh, Something in the Dirt, which is the best thing I saw oh. at the Lovecraft Film Festival. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's real good. And then uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, Nick Lutzko, uh, the uh, comedy musician mm-hmm. who did a uh, quartet of Halloween songs. Ooh. One of the people making new Halloween music uh, in general of the Spirit Halloween uh, yeah, yeah. trilogy fame. Uh, the four songs that he made for this year are all bangers mm. as well. Yeah. Nice. Oh, and accidental spooky thing. Uh, some YouTuber who I was watching told me that the new season of The Simpsons that came back was like a Simpsons Re- Renaissance. Okay. So I was like, okay, I'll watch this new Simpsons because I'm not as non amicable. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, they're kind of right. Uh, they're doing <laughs> weird shit that they would never do on The Simpsons, like resolving plots and dealing with internal conflicts that they've never, like, there's an episode where Nelson breaks down about how Bart has been a shitty friend forever and how much pressure he's under from his parents and like oh. how he does crimes to get attention. Or not Nelson. <laughs> um, what's his head? Uh, no, Martin. 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 Yeah. What? Uh, yeah. Um, there is an episode where uh, a really good episode about Marge criticizing Lisa and it's sticking in her head. Like that deals with like, you know, how mother's words like will impact daughters and stuff and like almost no jokes. It's just okay. like this very good episode. Uh, but the the accidental spooky thing I fucking saw is they do a Coen Brothers parody where, hey, kids, if you ever wanted to see Santa's little helper eat an entire human face, uh, <laughs> like a discarded human face, a freestanding face, you know, like a skid mask, yep. uh, you get to see the family dog eat the face of the rich Texan. You know, uh, like a skin mask. <laughs> you know, like a skin mask. I don't, I don't know how to describe a face that isn't attached anymore, <laughs> you know? Uh, so that was an accidental like thing that stuck with me in yeah. that episode, which was like weirdly violent and and dark. Huh. So are, like, are those on Disney? Like, well, like where yeah, are those at? It's, it's the most recent season that came to Disney. They're not all like good. Okay. Or anything like that. The one with uh, where Marge says the thing to Lisa. Mm. Mar- Marge calls Lisa chunky and it Ooh. sticks with her is really good. Oh, wow. Like, I was like, oh, this is a surprisingly like good, mature episode of the show that deals with act- uh, like Mo gets married. At some huh. point, like Mo finds love. Like he spent 20 years just doing suicide jokes. Uh huh. Like the entire joke was like, oh, Mo's going to stick his head in the oven. And like he meets him. The other thing that's happening in The Simpsons, and I haven't seen any discourse about this, but I'm kind of surprised that Chuds aren't mad at it for being woke because it's doing all these things that are weirdly like quietly woke. Okay. Like they run in, they go to a therapist in that episode and she has one breast. Like she's had a mas- mastectomy. Okay. No commentary. Huh. No jokes. There's just uh, the the woman who Mo uh, falls in love with and gets married is a little person. No commentary. Huh. No jokes. They just <laughs> exist in that world. Nice. Uh, it's it's weirdly impressive. Like it's not, you know, it's heights or anything, but it's like this is trying to do something. Yeah. And I got to yeah. hand it to, you know, I got to hand it to him. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is the most I have believed you when you have said <laughs> you need to watch Modern Simpsons. Good. Yeah, good. Uh, first of all, I don't think I've ever said you need to watch anything. <laughs> so, so, but the, um, I, uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, yeah, this is this. It is surprisingly. I'm not alone in this in thinking that it's doing new, new, near, no cool stuff. Nice as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Bo says, a quick question for Cole and a small one for both of you. Cole, have you ever visited the Billy Ireland Museum in Columbus? I'm making a trip there next summer and would love to hear uh, how a local views it. Uh, Also, do either of you have any uh, favorite non-Big 2 published comics? Thanks. Um, I have not visited the Billy Ireland Museum. That is something that I've wanted to for a while. It's like a museum for... The fuck's um, a Billy Ireland? Um, it's a museum for of like uh, like cartooning, cartooning and comic oh, stuff. Yeah, gotcha. Um, no, that sounds fun. Mm-hmm. So uh, haven't been there. Would be neat. Um, yeah. Uh, while, while while you're in the uh, area, go go to Kosai. Uh, even as an adult, that is fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was the place where we had the um uh, that yeah. one show. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And then uh, lots of favorite comics. They're not by the the big two. Mm-hmm. Um, the Alan Moore Avatar uh press lovecraft mm-hmm. stuff is great it's my favorite lovecraft media 
No, yeah, no. Yeah. So uh, the courtyard through Neo Nomicon through Providence. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's really good. Nice. Uh, I've not been reading Western comics a lot recently to where I could say, oh, yeah, I have a favorite one uh, that is not from those two. I'm not even reading, reading ones from the big two either. So there we go. Yeah. The uh, moving on to show questions, KL says, I enjoyed the Will and Cole duo episodes while Gary was under the weather. So I have a show pitch every week. Cole and Will trade off telling each other something that they find interesting in under five minutes. I think that sounds pretty entertaining in and of itself. Unironically, I am absolutely here for you're loving this. Aren't you Cole the podcast <laughs> uh, for normal people? The entertainment <laughs> value comes from the other host trying to distract and derail the storyteller with esoteric jokes uh trivia and diverticula and their gentle midwestern aggression so that they fail to complete their monologue in the allotted time i couldn't think of any appropriate stakes for what amounts to dueling ned flanders is but i'm sure cole and will will figure something out without going full on guppy on each other new shows are tough um and people uh have uh floated a lot of ideas for uh you know for 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 how for how to get me and will on a uh, uh on the on the same on the same show that is as good of a one as i have heard uh i would worry about running out of material for that <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course you would. Like I, I like I, I also don't know where this Tulpa conception of Will as an Icewood Western boy yeah. comes from. <laughs> I that's not uh, Will is polite to Cole because he doesn't know him. <laughs> <laughs> See, the thing is, once people start to know me, uh, the contempt I, can really shine th- through. That's no. Once Will starts to know people. He uh-huh. can start, he'll feel comfortable contempting them regardless <laughs> of the people. I meant that as the opposite. Um, but yeah, I don't, uh, like the, the, it, you have, Hale, you have zeroed in on a thing that both Will and Cole have in common, which is, uh, absolutely adoring knowing trivia and uh-huh. telling other people trivia. Yes. Uh, that is a thing that they both have in common doing it together. I think that what my, this is my legitimate feeling on what would happen if we did the show is that your politeness Cole would not flag and Will's would. And I say this with all kinds of love to Will, but I think he would run rough shot over you. (laughs) And it has nothing to do with you. Like, I'm not saying like, Oh, you you can't stand up for yourself. I just think that's what the show would end up being. Yes. But but because that would be, that that, that is a funnier dynamic than the two of us just being deferential to each other is the the, the thing. So like, Oh, just like, Oh, I mean, it would be kind of like those damn Ross kids again. Just like, okay, I can be the straight man here and and, and set stuff up. Yeah. The the real version of what KL wants is a show where Will is on with Will. <laughs> and we can't make that happen because we don't have the technology. But if we did, that would be, I'd listen to the shit out of that. <laughs> I would love to have Will confronted by his dark mirror. <laughs> this, the Cassandra Nova Will. <laughs> like, and, and again, I say this with tons of love in my heart. <laughs> one of my favorite all time favorite people, but I, I don't think, uh, and it's not, I also don't think that, uh, you two wouldn't be capable of being smart. Like uh-huh. interesting stuff could happen and be said yes. during that as well. I just think that it wouldn't be the entertainment bomb, uh, yeah. that is being supposed here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. My, my favorite dynamic involving will is me barging in to your dynamic together and fucking it up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's pretty perfect as is. Uh, yeah. And I, I personally think like, I, I really like that people like it. Uh-huh. I personally think that it would be less special if it happened all the time. Yes. Um, yeah. No, my favorite dynamic is when I can run uh tech run just like a non-speaking uh, part of the presentation. So mm-hmm. r- do you remember when it was like a, it was an online duck fest or something where I just started putting image, images. Up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah. It's great. <laughs> It's like, oh, you're talking about this thing. Well, have you seen this horrible piece of art from that thing? <laughs> like, yeah. And th- and that's, they basically did, uh, they made a Jackbox game that's basically that. Uh-huh. You know, because it's such a funny idea having somebody run the slides. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah. The, the the in the arms of the angel thing when the bus crashes happened. Yeah. 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 yeah very yeah, fun. I like that. <laughs> uh, Drew writes. 
With the amount of content you guys create, I've always been curious about how you stay organized and how much prep goes into any given recording session. Uh, do you just have a bunch of spreadsheets or do you use a dedicated project management system like Trello or Asana? Um, uh, and what does a typical WAF pre-production cycle look like? How detailed are your notes? Uh, and how much work does it take to massage them into a usable outline? Uh, sorry, if the, if I'm sorry for four questions in one. Feel free to be as vague or as detailed as possible. Um, so this is, a, this is a different answer for both, for both me and Gary. We're probably eventually going to get closer as we start, you know, looking at uh, ch changing the way we do stuff around. But like, I personally organize stuff using notion, uh, there, uh, just start with the template and have a cool little project management system in there that helps me keep uh, kind of my shit in you know, in mind the production, uh, steps for the different things uh, as they go. But like primarily when it comes to communication between the two of us, me and Gary, it's, you know, calendars and spreadsheets and, yeah. you know, just touch and base and slack. Yeah. I, I basically just use calendars and spreadsheets. Yes. Uh, cause I do less uploading, which requires less, uh, dates, mm -hmm. you know, and, and precision in that yes. respect. I, I, I don't cotton well to, to those kind of things. Like they, another thing to log into is always a huge bar for me to clear. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which is why like when Twitter goes away, I'm not going to switch over probably mm -hmm. uh, to other things. Like I don't want to log into a new thing. Uh, I'm, I'm full up. Can't hear, can't know no more how to hear more about tables. <laughs> I, I just, I don't want another thing. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I don't like things. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to log into a thing. Um, so I, I try, I have a limited attention span for that. So I try to keep, uh, keep that limited mm -hmm. you know, try to keep that number down. Yeah. I also have a, a bad, like a, a brain that keeps a lot of that stuff in mind until it, like it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, there's a weird, like I was a never studied kid. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, did good, good on tests, but never really studied. I just kind of like keep it all around. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I don't organize, do external forms of organization because I just kind of keep a mind map of things present at all times. Yeah. Uh, it's been, it's been a fun thing. Uh, this is a non-show related thing, but it's been fun live moving in is that like, she's much more organized than I am and, mm -hmm. you know, off ports or organization, whereas I just kind of put stuff, things. And then once I put something somewhere, I just know where it's at. Mm -hmm. And that just takes up a little bit of my memory and I just know it, Yeah, you know? So I just try to get as quickly to whatever works and then yeah. stop thinking about it as fast as possible. Right. Uh, uh yeah. for, for, for me, you know, I don't talk about this a lot because it's a real like modern day Twitter thing, but you know, having recently gotten an ADHD diagnosis and by recently, I mean like two years ago, I kind of realized that, uh, a lot of my organization stuff was like, was just, oh, not everybody has that because that was a coping mechanism because I just couldn't keep it all together without, yeah. without having those external, you know, scaffolds, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of set up around it. Uh, so like, it's like, oh yeah, no, that, that, that was totally uh, like, that, that's why everything was stressful. And that's why I wrote everything down all the time, multiple times was just to keep myself going. I like, you know, I was also a never studied kid, but like, you know, I was doing, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff to just to make sure that like bigger projects were moving as they needed to mm -hmm. move and like, make sure that no like little homework assignment fell off the plate. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a uh, wh whatever external systems you have to use to to make you know make your brain work mm -hmm. are good. Yeah. yeah, and I mean the outline is just an outline. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, yeah. Uh, Matt says uh, you had to pick a bad game for each other to play for a WAF. What would each of you choose that would be the absolute worst option for the other? Uh, not only what would be a bad game to play, but a bad game to talk about for an extended period. <laughs> mm. <laughs> what would be want to play a game? What the hell? <laughs> do, you want, do you want to make something that nobody involved will have fun with? <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I understand the idea behind why, why people listening might have fun with it. Uh -huh. uh, but I, 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 I get that idea. I don't yeah. know that's necessarily true. <laughs> I, can I again? I, I know I'm talking about I'm I'm real fiance pill lately. Can I okay, tell you a funny right. thing that's been that's been happening yeah. around the house? Yes. Uh, is I have been uh, like you know every night before bed I'll take my pills, mm -hmm. and then uh, I'll give Liv a kiss, and then I keep uh, pretending to slip pills in her mouth and going get ready for a surprise. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like the, the scary thing of somebody just kissed you a random medication 
(laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's upsetting. Um, Yeah, it's very funny. Yeah, you have to pick a bad game for each other to play. Uh, What would you choose? That'd be the absolute worst option. So, I mean, like, for 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 the I I could think of like no more just egregious form of violence than making Gary play uh um uh oh gosh like like a Steins Gate you know kind of thing yeah that'd be rough yeah. like a Danganronpa I mean even yeah. Danganronpa has some mechanics oh, <laughs> so. well that's good for it yeah the uh, <laughs> way to go little video game yeah <laughs> you'll get there someday uh, <laughs> the, um, yeah that would be that would be how long is that game. Uh, uh, Steins Gate? I, I don't know. Like, it, it's, it depends on your reading speed because it uh, is literally just reading just a, a book. Yeah, yeah. It's just reading, it's just reading a di- digital comic kind of thing. Yeah. 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 That would be a rough one. Yes. Uh, right now, and this, this is a sad answer uh, to me, and it might change as it happens, but it would be really hard for you to play Darkest Dungeon 2, mm-hmm. uh, which is, they're still working it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the feeling of not making progress is real. Oh yeah. Uh, like it, it's not enough for me not to like it. Like, I think it's already like a really good game. Mm-hmm. It's just a very narrow casted game. Yes. Um, yeah. And it's very narrative light. Mm-hmm. It's more narrative light than the first one. Okay. Um, significantly. So, hmm. uh, it's much more like a digital board game Yeah. Uh, yeah. Than, than the first one, but with, uh, much more difficult progression. Yeah. I, I would also feel really weird and bad doing that like covering that game now oh um, yeah it's a, it's a moving target like yeah. it's it's literally getting scholared once a month yes uh as they they do stuff so we wouldn't do that now but that's the the thing that pops out of my mind that hits all the wor- things you don't like about roguelikes mm-hmm. and then like also like one of the gold box games oh yeah, yeah. like sicko mode version of me could like play that mm-hmm. you know but those are rough yeah i uh, could see it Shall we move into the lightning round? We shall. Um, I will get a start here. Charlie Frame says, I would love, love, love for you to do a cast about Death Stranding, a.k.a. 2020 Vision, the game. No. It's nice to love. It- it's nice to love things. <laughs> um, I like that game and can talk about it. Uh, I uh, just, n- yeah, no, th- that would not be, that would not make for, yeah, no, no. Yeah. And not, it, you can, if you, if you want to blame it on somebody, you can blame it on me. Like, I just don't want to do something that I would hate. Uh, mm-hmm. And I can't, I'm not, uh, we talked about this a lot in the Metal Gear Solid 5 episode. So I think a lot of people who like Kojima also hate Kojima, mm-hmm. uh, but they hate him in a way that they have fun Yeah, with it. Uh, it's just not fun for me anymore. Yeah. Hating that guy. So like when somebody comes up and I'm like, I'm America's crumbled man mm-hmm. and I'm uh, here to tell you about the importance of connection. Like the way that that hurts me is not fun. Yeah. You know, it just makes me angry. <laughs> and, uh, I, life's too short. I don't want to be angry. I don't like it. Yeah. Uh, Maya says, uh, and it sucks because the mechanics are kind of interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I cannot trust that man to write a word. Right. Um, Maya says, uh, I have been working in dog care my whole life and love dogs more than human children. I know y'all are cat people, but what kind of dogs do y'all like? If any, also best pop culture dog. Brian Griffin from family guy. <laughs> the all time, but I was going to go with McGruff. Uh, <laughs> the, oh the cop <laughs> uh, he's a detective uh he also wrote an album you ever heard the mcgruff album no i haven't it's uh the songs are better than they have any need to be uh they're like catchy and have good melodies like it's still singing the mcgruff voice so it kind of sucks but they are weirdly catchy uh, i i love i love dogs i love spending time with dogs uh, i love dog energy mm-hmm. uh my friend jamie has a little pug named diego who i love uh, Andrew, who, uh, plays guitar in my band, um, used to have a do- dog named Clark who I loved. And now he rents dogs. He does that. Like where you take care of dogs for money. Oh, so huh. I get to see a wide varietal of like amazing dogs, nice. uh, listener to Bonfireside chat, the owners of Sauron, the one eyed, <laughs> uh, big, beautiful dog, uh, met him. And then recently I met tank who is a black Labrador dachshund mix, who is a black Labrador with just docks and legs. That's so Everything wonderful. up top is, is Labrador. Mm-hmm. Incredible fucking dog. It looks yeah. like a boogie board, <laughs> like moving around. <laughs> it, it's the closest to a Roomba you can get. Like it's, it's such an incredible, he's so nice and sweet. Uh-huh. I fucking love that dog. I, I was God. like, man, I just want, I want this dog. How exhausting would that be? 
<laughs> what a little a little owning a dog no, or owning no no, no to be to be that dog to be tank oh. Yeah, yeah. No, tank, tanks, well, that, the great thing is he's got those tiny little legs, so he just hangs around going <sighs> most of the time, and it's perfect. Like I'm just like, yeah, man, let's do it. Let's let's take a nap. Fuck this shit. I hate this. Let's stop being awake. You know. <laughs> oh, oh my god. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I like dogs as well. Um, I the, the like the nicest dogs that I have spent the most time around have been pit bulls. Uh, oh. so my, my brother's, uh, pit bull Lily is just the, the, the sweetest baby in the world. Uh, just so incredibly excited to see me whenever I see her. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, like I had a na- neighbor in college who had, uh, who had two pit bulls who, again, whenever they saw you, it was like the best thing ever, mm-hmm. you know, it was like, it was, it was like five super bowls is how excited they were to see you, you know? Um, yeah. So like, I probably, I'd probably say those, but like, I don't know. I don't miss working in an office because working in an office is terrible. However, my office, the last one that I worked in was dog friendly and I got to like, just hang around with some really cool dogs whose names and breeds I don't remember, but you know, like just, it was an emergency whenever they got near because you mm-hmm. had to go and give them, go and give them scratches. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, man pities. Hmm. It's, yeah, incredible dogs. I I don't think that I'm at a point in life where I'm going to have a dog, mm-hmm. though I, I think I will have one at some point. You know, it would just be too torturous to the cats right now, but like, yeah, I, yeah. I do love dog energy now as well. Yeah. Uh, not as much as I love cats. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Doug says, uh, Kirby inhales you. What powers does he gain no. while he holds you within his magic bladder? Not the power of my mouth, babies. <laughs> As I impregnate Kirby's big fecund face, <laughs> he inhales my dick chug. You, <laughs> you didn't have to. Good God. So Kirby inhales you is, <laughs> I don't know, man. I put the blame on Doug a little bit. <laughs> like, oh, doing a line of your balls, <laughs> like Kirby. Uh, you know, uh, I did the... <laughs> Self-deprecation it, is real tiresome, yeah. but I, you know, it's kind of my only instinct on this. All so the like, funny answers are like terminal diseases and mental illnesses. <laughs> yeah. You know, like there, there's a lot of very, uh, go-to hacky <laughs> joke answers for this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh <laughs> the ability to smile politely. Yeah. There you go. Let, let's, Kirby, let's Kirby doesn't smile politely. He smiles in like a vapid, scary way. Mm-hmm. He there's smiles like the, the gigantic goon from uh, hot fuzz. <laughs> You know, what if he smiled with feeling? How about you? Oh, I don't know. I I don't know how to do all my answers were just like self deprecating jokes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I know how to do stuff, but like it doesn't, uh, Kirby could eat other people for that. (laughs) I I could give him a list, a list of other people. (laughs) Like this man, Greg, I know. (laughs) I I think that, uh, it would be infertility. Hmm. Uh, and then he would, he would gain the ability to shoot blanks. Nice. Yeah, so you wouldn't have kerblets. You wouldn't have a mass attack from his, yeah. uh, his little brood of horrible little young. Yeah. Uh, ben says, uh, who is your area's goofiest personal injury lawyer? Gary, I will direct you to the Slack where I'm going to send okay. you something. Okay. Um, uh, this is not where I live right now, but Cincinnati uh, has a, or at least had, have been there for a few years, had a local uh, local lawyer named Blake Maislin. Uh, who um, uh, had billboards up. Uh, His his number is just, just fours, just press four until you get Blake. Um, uh, He's, he's on the billboard wearing boxing gloves. He's the boxing attorney. Um, And uh, uh, so next to his name is Blake Mason. And then in quotes, the attorney, attorney. Yeah. In quotes. is that supposed to be like his boxing name? Like here is Blake, to... the attorney Maislin. Yeah, that's that's what I think it's supposed to be, but it really makes it it makes it seem like his own billboard is sarcastic. Just... Blake Maislin, <laughs> the attorney. The attorney. <laughs> I really, I think wantmore.com is not a very uh, effective <laughs> no, website for this fellow. It, does, it doesn't correlate. None of this matches. Yeah. None no. of it hangs together, and I love it. <laughs> it's pretty confusing. I, I wish I had a, a good answer. I don't... Uh, I haven't, since I've lived in Portland, I haven't been near billboards, mm-hmm. uh, tons of billboards or anything. So yeah. the, uh, there's, there's the billboard districts of town, but I just haven't lived in them. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I know that's frustrating. So mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, I, I like Blake Mason though. Blake Mason's good. Yeah. 
Um, uh, uh, Old Man Varney, question for Cole. In the past, it has been mentioned that you own at least uh, a guitar uh, as a guitar player myself. I was wondering what brand slash model you own. Thanks. So I have I, I have four. I have a Squire Stratocaster that I'm currently upgrading, rehabbing kind of deal. It was my first guitar back in high school. Um, I have an Epiphone Les Paul. Um, I have a uh, Fender Acoustic which I would like to get a better one, but I recently did a, a, a whole bunch of stuff to that to make it play better, which is nice. And I have a a, um, a Squire Jaguar bass as well. Um, and they're fun. I enjoy playing them. Yeah. Uh, giving truth to the uh, novelty beer cup that we got for Andrew, which is, quote, I have too many guitars, unquote, said no guitar player ever. Yeah. Uh, in a real fun font. <laughs> <laughs> nice sarcastic um, cup. <laughs> yeah, uh, what a wise cup. We, we all have horrible cups. We, oh, yeah. you know, we we all we all did that for ourselves. And I have more than four keyboards. I'm not throwing shade. No, no, it's it, it's uh, it's it's like podcasts. You know, just you're, you never have just one. Start with yeah. one, but then you're gonna yeah. find you know, you get others. Yeah. Uh, finally, Tom says cast voice actors for Pocket, Jessica, Dottie, and Greta. Um, uh, I can go. Okay. Um, Dottie would be like Jenny Slate, but like a mean Jenny Slate. Okay. Yeah. And Greta would be Nicole Kidman. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Dignified, okay. but, uh, you know, can get intense when treats, you know, just when it okay. is time, you know, when it is time to uh, get your attention for something. Uh, I'm Jessica is a little tiny Christian shawl. No. Uh, because she's very sweet, but she's also got a lot of awkward okay uh, to her uh so it would play against a traditional you know cutie mm-hmm. baby voice pocket's really tough uh because pocket has gone through a lot of personality changes like his reputation that i've cultivated for him on the network is based on little demon pocket he's, he's mellowed out a lot years. he's gotten more he, regal he's incredibly regal and mellow and also very uh unconfident okay like he everything he does he like tests like he's he's got a real like nervousness uh, to him, not like not not skittish. Like he doesn't jump when you do stuff. He just like whenever he takes a step, he puts his hand down and kind of pats it to make sure it's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm gonna say uh, maybe the guy who played Fomin in Chernobyl. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Like kind of like a you know like a little bit like that is kind of what he's turning into. Yeah, yeah but yeah. also really sweet. It's it's hard because he's also really snuggly. Can, it's can very I, difficult. Pockets can, complicated. Can, can, can I can I give you one? Can oh, I give please. you one for that? Steven Tobolowski. Oh, Steven Tobolowski's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I could I could see Steven Tobolowski for Pocket. And he used to be like Jack Black. You know, like, <laughs> like yeah. but he yeah. just he's now he's just like the calmest, sweetest little boy. Oh, it's, like it's all wonderful. he wants to do is for me to jump on the bed and for him to come up and take a nap. Like it's like oh, literally so, the only thing he wants. That's perfect. Yeah, Love he's, it. He's 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 a great cat. Uh <laughs> The, uh, the, the cats have been sleeping on both of us mm-hmm. uh, and it's so great. Like I get up and use the bathroom and they're on, on live and live will be like, Hey, last night I went to use the bathroom and the cats are on you. And I'm like, Oh, they're coordinating. <laughs> like, <laughs> they're figuring out, we got a system going, I guess. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah. It's, oh man. I love a cat on me. I love um, a cat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So thanks everybody. We appreciate you, uh, you writing in your questions. Um, if you want to ask questions next time, these are open for patrons. Mm-hmm. Uh, go to patreon.com slash duckfeed TV, join us, and you can ask a question. If we didn't get to your question, we'll get to it in either the next episode or a roundup. Yeah. Uh, we have a roundup coming out here pretty soon. So we're going to be uh, digging to the bottom of the barrel here. Not bottom mm-hmm. of the barrel. We're going to have yeah. cleared out the hopper. <laughs> Tell me more, Cole. <laughs> Tell me more about <laughs> these dog sick questions you hate. No. <laughs> no. I'm just, I'm kidding. I know you didn't mean that. Uh, yes. Let's read some, read some responses. Let's do. Yeah. Uh, we've got responses about Deus Ex, Mankind Divided, Super Hot, and Half Life Alex. Uh, and let's get started with uh, Deus Ex, Mankind Divided. Ian says, uh, You briefly discussed it, but I remember the hacking in the new Deus Ex being pretty fun with lots of great rewards. Uh, many of which fleshed out to the world more. Uh, I've recent, recently been playing through Cyberpunk uh, and find the hacking in that game simplistic and the rewards not at all not at all interesting. 
Uh, would you be able to discuss the hacking of Deus Ex a little bit more? What mechanics uh, do you feel make hacking immersive? And are there any other examples of games you think did a great job of hacking? Uh, yeah, we we the reason why we didn't talk about that more is because it is really similar to how it is in Human Revolution. Right. And it was already like a very long episode. Mm hmm. You know, uh, but uh, and the hacking I found, what's really interesting, like in the Slack and reading about it, incredibly divisive. Weird. Uh, the new Deus Ex hacking. Uh, the people who hate it, hate it. Huh. Uh, like just absolutely loathe it. For me, the thing that I like about it uh, is that it creates situations where I barely make it all the time. Yeah. Uh, I successfully hack with less than a second to spare constantly that's that's super important the you know getting situations where you just barely make it you know mm -hmm. like those outnumber uh the times where i make it safely uh primarily because it is super easy the way that it works you know to like feel things out and then just oh i'm really far along in this graph and i have not had any um uh alerts on this yet i can get a little bit more adventurous i can go for that data store i can do all of that and then have my bug out plan uh ready yeah. to go when it is so like it's kind of designed in such a way that uh even if it is not going to be a buzzer beater you you're, you're, you know you're tempted into making it into one you know yeah um yeah i i think that they could do a much better job of explaining it uh because it's not tutorialized yeah it, it's also a thing you do a lot Yes. So I, I could also understand somebody getting sick of it, mm -hmm. you know, um, but it, it works for me. It's the right level of interactive. Yeah. Uh, for me. And in terms of games that I think also do a good job of that, um, it's tricky, right? Because you don't, it's really hard not to wear out your welcome. Yes. With that. Like I love pipe dreams, but it wears out its welcome, you mm -hmm. know, in say your Bioshocks. Um, and you also don't want it just to become the focus of the game. So, like, I really love hacking in Shadowrun, the mm -hmm. Genesis game. Yeah. Uh, specifically, not the not the new ones, specifically the Genesis one. But it's a major system. Yeah. If you had to do it with the frequency, you do it in Mankind Divided, and it was a virtual reality meta overlay metaphor like that, it would get tedious. Yes. Um, so like, I would say for me, uh, the new Deus Ex games have the ceiling of how complicated I want hacking to be, mm -hmm. um, but still within my, you know, my zone. Yeah. I haven't played, um, I haven't played cyberpunk to know what that hacking system is like. So mm -hmm. I don't know what their rewards are. I think something that is really important is there needs to be some kind of uh, consequence for failure, you know, mm -hmm. alarms or it, uh, locks something off. Um, yeah. I think, you know, just the, the system needs to be integrated in something else, um, in order for it to feel good as opposed to just feeling like a key, um, you know, a, a lock that you need to, uh, you know, get open. Right. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I, I can't compare it to cyberpunk. Uh, yeah. you know, I want to play that. I have not yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, Andrew says, I find it interesting how often people describe this game as short. Obviously, as you noted in the episode on the game, it's quite a long title, at least as long as Human Revolution. I think the relatively abrupt ending and middle chapter nature of the story makes the game feel shorter than it really is. I loved exploring Prague in this game and the DLCs. I wonder occasionally is if it would be worth going back and trying out Breach Mode. Does that still even exist or have Square Enix shut down the servers? I, I don't know. I didn't I, fuck up, fuck with it either. And I didn't find out it had story content until I was doing research for the episode. Right. Yeah. So couldn't tell you. I, don't know. Yep. Soon it was Chalice Dungeons mm -hmm. um, or VR missions rather. Yes. Either. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um, I also agree with you. I don't think this game is short. No, it just, it's, you know, it is a middle chapter though. Yes. You know, so like <laughs> you can say something like, oh, it ends before I wanted it to, which could mean it's short, but also it means like, oh, the story left me wanting more. Like, you know, the, the, there, there is little resolution to what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. It's, it's a yeah. pacing problem more, more so than it is like an overall like length actual problem. length. And usually yeah. that's the case. Yes. Yeah. Um, Amory writes, uh, do you share my impression that Eastern European stories tend towards grim, poor community settings, maybe for sad and obvious reasons, and that they share a unique brand of really affecting melancholy? I am so drawn to stories from that part of the world, probably needs interrogating, uh, and will snatch any precious opportunity to explore that kind of space in games and books. The Hungarian police want me for preemptive 
breaking and entering apartment charges. <laughs> the, the, uh, Do not go to Hungary. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah. Seems like problems to me. Yep. Oh. Uh, the, uh, I also like that area yep. in games. Uh, we talked about this way back in the pathologic episode. I like it because we just don't get a lot of mm-hmm. games there and it feels like a new dichotomy. Yeah. Uh, you know, there. And one of the things I would say about Mankind Divided specifically is that, like, parts of it are that grim, poor community setting, but parts of Prague are luxurious. Yes. Uh, large swaths of it. Like, it's also mm-hmm. showing wealth and prosperity in this thing. It's just a different flavor than we usually get, which is Shibuya or New York. America Town. <laughs> right. You know, I just, I just want to go to a new place. Mm-hmm. I, I never want to go down to Yakuza Street again, and I don't want to you know, go do a modern military thing in a brown desert. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to just go through New York unless yeah. I'm Spider-Man and I'm going through it in a fun way. Yes. You know, yeah. I'm sick of those three settings. Uh, very much so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think you're, no- you absolutely are noticing a trend. I do not know. Uh, I've not spoken to somebody from Eastern Europe to like, see how they feel about like the fact that so much of their media, like, like, Oh, mm. I, I love how miserable your books are. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's like, well, yeah, well, we actually have like a, just a lot of bad stuff has happened over here, dude. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I just, uh, I, I, maybe it needs interrogating. I don't know. I just, I like reading yeah. stuff, you know, be, be a good question for, for somebody from that area. Like yes. we're not, I don't think we're equipped to, to speak to it. Like we appreciate it. And, uh, I don't have the skills right now to examine it. Uh, right. I would need to meet somebody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Uh, Riley says, I enjoy Adam Jensen largely because of his performance, but he's a character uh, and mankind divided uh, as a game would be a lot stronger. if It was more willing to delve into his feelings and personal problems instead of having him be kind of aloof to his world. Adam doesn't need neuropathy like the other Augs. He doesn't need to fear deportation to Golem. And we rarely get to hear him be open about his feelings, about the discrimination he faces, or guilt uh, for his failure years ago. I wonder if having Malik, uh, the pilot from Human Revolution, could have helped with this. Her and Adam had some of the best chemistry in that game, and it's a friendship that could have uh, more easily allowed Mankind Divide to explore those emotions. While I accepted long ago that we won't see Mankind Divide Part 2, if or hopefully when Deus Ex does return, I hope we can see an older Adam in a supporting role, kind of like JC in Invisible War, instead of leaving him behind forever. It's weird because it feels like they tried to make Adam into a um, into a cipher. Yeah. Uh, but you do not write somebody like that or give him that performance if you want him to disappear. <laughs> no, yeah, he, he doesn't disappear at all. Right. He's also just like my, the way I've, I don't think Riley's wrong about this. The way I came to peace with it is appreciating him in a non-character way, like <laughs> not taking him seriously. Right. You know, say, same way I, I don't take JC Denton seriously, mm-hmm. just a different flavor. Yeah. You yeah. know, like uh, this, this is a, a, a limp biscuit, JC Denton. Uh, and it, it's not a good it doesn't that does not speak well to the game or the writing of the character right it's right. just how i've come to enjoy his presence as being kind of funny mm-hmm. yeah you know? i did um, miss malik in this uh malik's great they, they couldn't they couldn't bring her back because like oh, oh like that was a choice you made at the yeah. end of human revolution so that's a bummer um i think i thought their dynamic was good you just get chicane uh, mm-hmm. and, and there is your chopper guy and he just kind of like low key hates you. <laughs> yeah. You, you also get, um, what's her head who is a little bit better, but she, she fulfills a plot function as being the representative of Janus. So it's uh, a little bit less good. Oh, you mean, um, the psychiatrist? No, no, no. Uh, the lady who, the hacker collective lady. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Alex. Yes. Alex. Yeah. So she, she's a little bit better in terms of kind of you know charisma between the two of them but she also mm-hmm. just again is a plot yeah. force we're we're running into something that is true of these the story of any of these games just immediately falls out of my head like a sieve faster than any other <laughs> like faster than almost anything else they're not really the point yep the story and the characters you know? just gone just yeah. uh, washed away it's, it's down the drain yeah. nope it's not a, not a a story focused game nope yeah you know, it's not it kind of undo a story <laughs> it's, not, it's not it's not about that yeah. Um, Elliot writes to me, mankind divided is, uh, the best, almost greatest, <laughs> almost, well, let me see here. It is the best, almost greatest game of all time. 
Um, it feels perfect in the hands, looks incredible, and has all of the quality of life features that a modern Deus Ex should, whilst lacking some crucial elements. Unlike Cyberpunk 2077, I feel this game has a much better grip on the problems of technology, transhumanism, and what happens when powerful people with their mobs actively uh, with their mobs actively work against the, the democratization of the public good, atomize privilege, and manufacture consent. Atomize. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> atomize. Oh, you're doing a Pritchard privilege. thing. Okay. Yeah. That's like, not Pritchard. What? It's not with Pritchard. Adam. What? No, that's not Pritchard. Pritchard's the guy who goes, Jensen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Who does the Adam? Is, is that Sarah? Uh, that's Sarah. Okay. Atomize. There go. Son. Okay. Son. <laughs> yeah. um, it does leave a lot to be desired at points. It would have been nice if they delved deeper into themes such as poster boy elites now being at the bottom of the social ladder uh, or more commentary on how technology makes us discriminate and be used as a tool for prejudice. Um, but, uh, what is there is fairly interesting and at times very well presented, whether it's the media control or the hypocrisy of hate. Uh, I also think it is, uh, it is very important to acknowledge the poor choice of language used in and around the game relating to the contemporary social movements and historical prejudice. Uh, the team should have known better than to include that kind of thing. The main story can certainly drag at times, and I often feel a bit conflicted over why Victor is doing what he did. Um, perhaps this is the biggest piece of evidence for a project dropped uh, dropped short, uh, packaged up and ready to ship with some fairly heinous advertising. But where I think Mankind Divided shines uh, is its side stories and its world building. Prague is an absolute masterclass. Um, in hub world design, it is packed to the brim with interesting characters and details that make it a fully realized and cohesive lived in space. Truly an, an, an incredible immersive sim uh, that I feel at times rivals the original Deus Ex. Mankind Divided is at its uh, is at its worst um, is at worst a missed opportunity, uh, and at its best an incredible experience that leaves you wanting so much more. Either way, it just misses out on becoming one of the all time greats. Here is to hoping that Jensen's story is continued in the near future and Deus Ex Mankind Divided gets the sequel its fans and its legacy deserves. Uh, yeah, me. Mm -hmm. I also hope that. Yeah. What, no. what I would love is with this uh, this new takeover, if they complete this trilogy and then they do an Alex and they it's like, oh, no, no, this this franchise is back. We're not going to do this trilogy more. Let's mm -hmm. do a sequel finally. Yeah. You know, re if, it, if it's a big hit. Um, you know, which means I'm telling you personally, everyone listening to buy it, uh, <laughs> then, then maybe they'll, they'll do, you know, what's a, what's a modern, what happens after invisible war? Yeah. You know, that'd make me really happy or even yeah. a remake of invisible war would be really cool. <laughs> um, just p p pick up after the possible endings of Deus Ex and just, you yeah. know, <laughs> try, try, try and make it good this time. <laughs> yeah. 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 Leave the Omar in there and then mm -hmm. everything else, Yeah, you know, and the gun that melts glass make sure those things are in there yeah. <laughs> while we're taking the requests. Yeah. 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 Uh, moving on to super hot responses. Tom says, loved your super hot episode. Just wanted to call out my favorite feature in the, Oh shit. Actually, before we get into this, uh, let me, I have a quick, uh, I made a mistake. Oh, so when we were talking about super hot, uh, this, we were talking about the, uh, controversy about self harm. I had not beaten the VR version. Okay. Um, so at the end of that, that makes you shoot yourself. That is the controversy. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was the scenes where you're shooting your double. You oh, know? yeah. And I was, and that are in the regular Deus Ex or uh, super hot. And I was like, oh, that that's kind of silly. Mm. Like to, you know, but no, I, that was my mistake. Yes. So I meant to mention that actually at the beginning of this episode and I forgot. Huh. Uh, so yeah. So if I, if I sounded dismissive about people's concerns about self-harm imagery, uh, I apologize. I just, I was thinking of it as a different thing is because I had never beat the VR version. Yeah. So I just didn't get there. So my, my bad for not uh, looking into it more. Cool. Um, Tom says, uh, loved your super hot episode. Just want to call out my favorite feature in the VR version. You can use items like pans and bottles as shields from bullets. It's very funny to swat an errant shot away like a bug with a frying pan. I found out the hard way when I played the original version, this is a VR only thing. Katana's notwithstanding. <laughs> no. you can in the regular version you can throw a thing to deflect mm -hmm. a bullet it just won't work in your hand right yeah you can't melee swing a thing yeah 
Mm, I need to finish. I need to finish Super Hot VR. It's hard. It's it I is. think the game is too hard for VR. It has the the loop is irritating. It's mm-hmm. too long. Yeah, the checkpointing is a problem. Yeah, yeah. I wish that the checkpointing was more generous, and I would have already beat it. Yeah. So, uh, Andrew writes. I was surprised at how well they have done in expanding the concept and sequel products. The VR version is great. Uh, the roguelike one was also fun, but not quite engaging enough to get me back uh, get, to get me going back in my now more limited game time. Yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah, they they did a they do a good job of expanding mm-hmm. on the concept. Yeah, I think. Uh, David says during your discussion of Super Hot, you did an aside about the grave of Benny Hill maintaining the stability of time. God, sentences! This, I fucking love this job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, it, well, buckle up. The story of Benny Hill's real grave is almost as weird. Benny Hill is buried in my hometown and was known for being fairly wealthy locally. After he died, a rumor started that he was buried with gold and jewels, <laughs> like some kind of pharaoh. <laughs> During the early 90s, for emphasis, the 90s, his grave was dug up overnight and his coffin opened by would-be grave robbers. As far as I'm aware, the culprits never found, uh, were never found and Benny Hill was reinterred, but this time with a huge stone slab over the grave to deter thieves. <laughs> Well, this does nothing to deter the image of English people as awful, disgusting, irrational idiots. I thought you would enjoy it. Uh, you guys never got over your grave, Robin, huh? Yeah. It's, it's still yeah. fun for you? Still, so, 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 still, still going to do it? You know, I oh. don't want to. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> far, uh, far, far be it for me to, you know, just yeah. to really lay, lay into that tiny island of bog turfs. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just another normal day on Normal Island. <laughs> the gas stations won't beep in honor of the Queen. Um, the, you know, we're, of course, dying all over here. It's, of course. Yeah, no, it's living. fucking terrible. Don't come here. Uh, <laughs> Don't yeah, get hungry. That, Don't come that's here. Very funny. The idea of the Betty Hills treasure. <laughs> uh, finding it like that god that somebody should make a movie about that or they should do like i want to write a call of cthulhu module <laughs> about these grave robbers <laughs> like, that's god. rad uh, I'd, man i just like did, did 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 the urban legend like get to a curse too oh like... uh, the curse of any hill like you can't stop running <laughs> it's like speed uh man i yeah i i really like that that's, that's phenomenal really good. thank you so much Thank mm-hmm. you so much for sharing that. <laughs> this is a this is a quick note. I hate when people are buried with treasure. What uh-huh. a waste. Yeah. You shouldn't bury people with treasure. It's fucking no. dumb. People could use that treasure. They're starving people and you're gonna be buried with a scepter? Fuck off. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, buried buried with personal effects. Like uh uh what, my like worthless my, personal effects. Right. Like my step grandpa yeah. when he passed away back in two thousand two, you know, a big thing that we we did on that side of the family was play poker. Play poker a yeah. lot. Penny, you know, penny poker. So I uh, got a little deck of cards to put into the casket with them. Right. Yeah. Sweet. That's fine. That stuff's that's, cool. That's, that's good. Not treasure. <laughs> Not treasure. Or even like, you know, don't bury with my phone. Yeah. You know, cause one, I don't want the distraction uh, as a ghost. <laughs> uh, but the second, uh, you know, sell that and give it, do something with it. Yeah. I'm fucking dead. God, I hate yeah. being buried with treasure. I hate it. It's like, I'm so passionate about people being buried with riches. <laughs> it sucks so bad. Even a nice suit is dumb. Uh-huh. Just like do a cardboard cutout of the front of a suit. Yeah. Like. No, just put me in there naked. You know, yeah, I, I got no loose. soul. Yeah. yeah. Do it raw. I, I just, yeah, I don't, do not like being buried with valuables. Yeah. Makes me cranky. <sighs> it's weird. I had to go shopping for the clothes that my grandpa was going to be buried in. Ah, geez. Did you get him like a cool, I'm with stupid shirt or something? Got him a mascot <laughs> suit. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> got him a big dogs. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, Man, big dogs should get into the funeral business. They should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's some bones you won't dig up. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Uh, this, is, uh, this is going to be me. Micah says, uh, thank you for including Super Hot. I don't generally like first person shooter games, uh, but knowing y'all were doing it for WAF made me finally give it a try. Uh, leading targets turned out to be a fun intellectual exercise. Rather than clicking heads, uh, you often need to pick an empty space in front of a running guy and click there instead. And you don't immediately know if your calculations were correct. Uh, you have to run in circles to make time and your bullet go. The waiting is part of the fun. When you do it right and the bullet actually connects, it feels like you made a discovery or solved a puzzle. Uh, and I was surprised that just hearing the connection was enough. After firing a shot, I could hoof it for cover. 
uh, the sound of shattering crystal behind me was all the positive reinforcement I needed. Yeah, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Uh, something, something we didn't talk about in the episode, I don't think is how, uh, super hot, you know, we talked about how it works in the context of shooting games. Like you need to have FPSs, but we didn't talk about it specifically inverting hit scam. Yeah. You know, which is what what you're talking, speaking to. Yeah. It's a skill Um, like no, like knowing how to lead and knowing like when the right time to shoot is, you mm -hmm. know, uh, as well. Uh, just like, okay, no, they're going to be moving and they're running, um, uh, you know, perpendicular to me. No, no dice. Not going to, not going to shoot now. Yeah. Projectiles are so much cooler than hit scan because you can do something about them. Yes. You know, and enemies can as well. It's mm-hmm. why like in even old games, like in doom, the, the hit scan enemies were an emergency and they're rare. Yes. You know, uh, where projectiles are plentiful. So, or the, the auto firing hit scan yeah. enemies, the machine, machine gun guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, moving on to Half-Life Alex responses, Gabriel says, Half-Life Alex was the game that pushed me over the fence to buy a VR headset. My PC wasn't beefy enough at the time to play it, so uh, in turn, this game ended up being the most expensive game I've ever bought if you consider the hardware cost as part of the tag. That said, the money was well spent. I probably couldn't justify that last sentence without also being an avid flight sim player. Microsoft Flight Simulator in VR is a childhood dream come true. Uh, Half-Life Alex made me feel real emotion through play, which is something that almost never happens anymore. The Souls games made me feel real uh, tension and stakes for the first time since I was a kid, and Alex made me feel fear for the first time in a game in probably ever. There's a layer of abstraction for me with video games and most media. I realize I am playing a game, so I do not fear. Making it to the final bracket of a battle royale might give an effect close to fear, but I'd round it closer to plain anxiety. But enough anxiety and fear. Uh, could be the same thing depending on who you ask the medium itself is a buffer which eats all the fear horror games just end up being item management sims with creepy cool vibes which i dig but i do not feel fear i felt scared for the first time in game the first time i was backing myself into a corner slowly retreating from a zombie uh combined with a head crab on it i don't know it's alex's uh lame joke from half-life 2 uh that's zombine that's why i should have said it my bad. Uh, fumbling around trying to reload like I'm Hank Schrader about to take an <laughs> axe to the face before finally getting those rounds off. I had to pause and take the headset off and catch my breath. I think VR, the medium, is a hard argument for immersion in games. Case in point, Half-Life Alex. That sensation paired with the extra dimensional mindfuck, uh, the last section of the game. Uh, I'm not going to leave this in here because this is a spoiler. Yeah. And we made this a spoiler thing in the, uh, in the episode. I, yeah. So I'm just, I'm not going to finish that sentence, uh-huh. uh, but Gabriel <laughs> likes Half-Life Alex uh-huh. <laughs> uh, in favor of the ending of it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, agreed. The, the Hank Schrader thing is actually a really good point on, that, uh, that is, yeah, <laughs> you're doing Schrader, Schraderisms. The, uh, this is me being an obstinate sicko, but I'm always, whenever, you know, we talk about this a lot in the thing where I'm, I talk about the, the value of like immersion and games and stuff mm-hmm. is that I, I like the artifice artifice of things make it uh, in a general sense yeah you know like i I like i like games feeling like games i like instruments sounding fake Mm -hmm. um i like all of those things and that's just me being an old sicko yeah you know i i think that gabriel is probably closer to to most folk in that respect Mm -hmm. um yeah Uh, yeah no i mean that, that that stuff that gabriel described worked on me like eventually i got you know, so I didn't get myself into those situations, but like those initial feelings were really good. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, and I had that too. Like I had that, that feeling of, of being close to something and scared of it, mm-hmm. especially during that chapter, which I also don't want to spoil. <laughs> uh, we, we've, we backed ourselves into a weird corner. We have uh, talking about this here. So, <laughs> and making it a premium episode. So yeah. yeah. Uh, Toby writes, I was worried going into Half-Life Alex for a few reasons. I'm easily spooked and don't really play horror games. Alex leans into that side of Half-Life and with the addition of VR, uh, which is still very new to me, the thought of having to deal with head crabs jump scaring me and leaping at my face had me preemptively pissing my pants. Uh, I was also more broadly concerned about whether Valve could pull this off. Do Valve even have enough game designers left around to make a game to the high standard that we've come to expect? in a totally new design space and with one of the most beloved properties in gaming. 
but my worries turned out to be unfounded. Uh, it is, it's been fantastic the whole way through, and my pants have remained unpissed despite some excellent tension <laughs> and scares. Hell yeah, brother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One day at a time, bud. <laughs> yeah, like, now, do, where do you get your tokens from now for that? I, 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 <laughs> mine re-upped. <laughs> Uh, there are too many things to, uh, to praise. So I'll just mention one, the encounter design. So many encounters felt like they should have been just too, just, uh, too much to handle. Um, uh, take the encounter where you get the flashlight in the sewers and they throw not one, not two, but three poison head crabs at you as an introduction to that enemy. Uh, or the one where you're trapped, uh, in a cramped basement maze fighting two of the electro pups while having waves of zombies keep coming at you. Uh, these encounters by all rights, uh, should have been too hard, uh, but they've clearly been fine tuned and play tested to death so that they hover right in the sweet spot just before challenging it is over into unfair. At least that's how it felt to me. Um, the amount of care and attention that went into Alex makes me both hopeful and sad. Valve doesn't really make games anymore, but Alex shows that there are enough people from the old days around, or there's enough institutional memory for them to still be completely capable of doing Valve shit, trademark, to a high level. Uh, the question now is whether they'll actually keep using this capability to make the incredible single player games that they built their reputation on. I hope so. Hope so. That, that was a big, you know, a big takeaway for, mm-hmm. for me from, from Alex was like, man, it feels good to have half-life back. Yeah. And if half-life is back, I'm very happy. that. Half-Life and if it's not, back. it was cruel to give us hope. Yeah, I mean, it was still I'd rather, <laughs> rather have loved and lost, you know. But <laughs> yeah. but still, it w- it was definitely cruel to give us hope. Yes, uh, because it is, uh, you know, they can they can still get it. Mm-hmm. You know, they can do it. Uh, can as for it. the encounter design, like we talked about that that in the episode, like the highs that you mentioned are good and high. Generally, though, we've got some problems with, uh, you know, just like wave based stuff that happens in it. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know whether I like the encounter design in it. I think that it's it's the my primary question with the VR is if the effect matters is the only thing that matters or if the way you get there matters yes and the effect it has is that but it does feel like a limited currency to me mm-hmm. um yeah it, the, a real a cool experiment which i don't know that i'll have time to do would be if the mod comes out for the 2d or the non-vr version mm-hmm. if they do that total conversion that they're making with workshop and playing them back to back oh yeah yeah. i think that that would be like the equivalent of a left-handed oil test in terms Mm -hmm. of like figuring out where the deficiencies or rooms for improvement might lie in Uh, that this is an honest question uh can you define left-handed oil test for me uh, yep i was just saying that like it's a thing uh it's a it's a a little episode of tube talking here there's a uh a a epicurious series i like to watch um with a guy who designed a kitchen gadget designer uh, oh yeah that guy is a, like a big accessibility guy he like does yeah. the uh, uh just like oh here, here's gimmick gadgets like yeah. uh what do these do and how would i improve it kind yeah. of thing yeah and what, one of the things is he take you he d- uses them with his left hand covered in oil oh. because it shows him where to there be deficiencies yes to, to, to simulate somebody with uh uh like grip problems with like ar- yes. arthritis yeah yeah uh that's what i was thinking of gotcha. like it would it, putting those next to each other would show you the places where where it's the pure encounter design or whether it's encounter design designed for people being new to it, like things being new to a medium, Uh huh. you know? Yeah. 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 No, it sounded like a ghastly euphemism, but I didn't want to immediately go there. No, I, it definitely did. I should have definitely clarified that. <laughs> uh, this is me, right? Elliot? Yes. Elliot says after such a long time between half-life installments, I was genuinely nervous that I might experience some gimmick or a half-baked concept. I bought an Oculus Rift S just for this game, as well as a new PC, having no exposure to VR before this and feeling unsure about my purchase. But my fears were quickly an afterthought. Taking off the headset after a few hours of play, all I could think to myself was, yeah, this is definitely a Half-Life game. Valve managed managed to continue a type of storytelling, world-building, and interface that I find complete and polished, demonstrating uh, that restraint is often the best way to deliver a rich experience. I was so happy to see the tone of the story continue in the same vein. A world filled with tiny details with big lore implications and a lot of gaps for my imagination to run wild. 
Seeing City 17 in VR was intimidating, was an intimidating and intimate experience. The animation of the Vortigaunts, Striders, and Combine was something to behold. The art style is still incredible and manages to depict a cartoonishly real sci-fi dystopia with just the right amount of mystery and comedy. Also, was I the only one who thought the faces of the zombies without the head crabs look like they would stink? <laughs> uh, Valve has, has managed to push the medium forward yet again with the Half-Life franchise. It may not be perfect. Future titles may surpass it with the hindsight of its inspiration, but I feel they have successfully demonstrated that with every Half-Life release, they managed to answer a specific philosophical question about the gaming landscape. I hope that in 20 years' time, I will feel the same way about what comes next in the series. <laughs> But until then, just like Half-Life 1 and 2, Half-Life Alex has taken its rightful position next to its predecessors. Uh, in, in what is that word? Inculcating? inculcating? I don't know that word. Uh, inculcating itself uh, as a platonic ideal when you're trying to answer the question, what does it mean to be an excellent game? Yeah. What's inculcating mean? To like to instill, to like put in. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't yeah, know just... that word. Mm-hmm. Damn. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I'm I'm happy to hear somebody else likes the tone. I I, I feel like they like they they did very well with that. Yeah, uh, I I would agree. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't have more to add on that. Yeah, <laughs> no. Uh-uh. Um, and I have this one. It came in late, uh, but it was fun, and it was it also came in as a as a comment. But uh, but Charlie had this to say about uh, the Evil Within two. Figured it'd be fun to fun to read it here. Charlie says, uh, "I know you guys don't take late responses to games, but uh, this but happened to oh, good, not true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we do. Yeah, uh, we, like yeah. Yeah. like right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but this happened to me on the seventeenth of October, uh, and it's entirely because of the Evil Within two on WAF. Uh, on the seventeenth, two of my best friends in the world held their wedding ceremony. It was a great time, though not without stress for the bride and groom." Um, I've known these two for over a decade now, and we all share a pretty crass sense of humor. So they've heard me say some pretty foul shit, you know, waff level stuff, nothing hateful or vile. So, uh, at the, as the reception was winding down and the band was playing, uh, and the band was playing, the groom sits down at my table to chat and unwind after everything. I gave him some fond well wishes and congrats before hitting him with both barrels with some truly magic words that came from Cole talking about the evil within two off on Twitter. So I've got a powerful pair of words to share with you that I saw on Twitter, and now I'm going to share them with you. Oh God, he says, chuckling. I looked him in, I looked him dead in the eye. Um, and as enunciated and powerful as I could said, blasted cumscape. All he did was say, God damn it, John, and suppress a gut laugh. At this point, the bride walked over uh, and asked uh, what I said, knowing full well it was probably just some of my bullshit. The groom tried to wave it off as just that. Not being one to let a golden opportunity slide, I said, oh, I just burdened him with some horrible knowledge. Now that you're married, you should share burdens, though, right? Come on, buddy. Share that. Pause for a half a beat. Load. (laughs) He just shook his head, and I laughed, trying to keep keep from being too loud um the bride looked right at me and said this is some of your bullshit i nodded and she laughed and the conversation moved on later she learned the ultra combo of words that is blasted cumscape uh and had a real good laugh at that so thank you both for giving me the absolute gem of a wedding gift i, I hope yeah. you got them something else in addition to that two word blasted phrase. cumscape i hope you wrote yeah. it in the guest book at the very least <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's very Signed. sweet <laughs> the blasted cumscape. Uh yeah, that is that is very sweet. Uh yeah, weird to think of uh talking about Waff at a wedding. Mm-hmm. It's sweet. Yeah. No. Uh thank you. Uh and thanks everybody for writing in. If you have things to say about Tides of Numenera or Shadow on Hong Kong, please go to duckfeed.tv slash contact by the 15th of December. Yeah. Um, uh, please keep your responses relatively brief. I let some longer ones in on this one just because we didn't get a lot of responses mm-hmm. about, uh, you know, uh, your uh, your Half-Life Alex and what have you. Um, and if you have thoughts about multiple games, please separate them into multiple responses. Um, the deadline for January's games, similarly, is going to be um, January the 15th. It's always the 15th. And we are ready to announce what those are going to be. Yeah. Uh, so w- the beginning of next year is awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, first up, 
we got uh, a coal pick. We got what remains of Edith Finch. Yeah. Neat walking sim. The but bones, it has the skin. <laughs> we'll find out. The, 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 the question is answered is the thing. Oh, nice. Yeah. I haven't played that. I saved it for work. Mm-hmm. It's a walking sim, but it is one of the most varied of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is a really, 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 it is a very neat idea for a, um, a short story collection as a game. Something I've talked about uh, really enjoying in the past. So, yeah. It's, it's also a nice contrast with the, uh, the things we have coming up later yes. in the month, which are a bit more meaty and from very different eras and such. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next game we're going to be doing is Heretic. Yeah. Yeah. First person um, shooter spell casting kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. The the attempt to add like inventory and RPG elements and fantasy elements to the Doom model. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is from a sponsor, Abe. And then for our premium episode for January, we're doing a game that you you all knew we'd do eventually. Uh, this is also sponsored by a, uh, a patron. We're doing Hades. Yeah. Starting yeah. off with more roguelikes. Yep. Uh, gonna... It's not the, the first and won't be the last. Uh, the, no, I'm uh, excited he, to play Hades. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, you'll like Hades. Yeah. Um, the uh, Some caveats. Uh, one, uh, we're not going to completionist this. Um, I played Hades before and I put like 20 hours into it and saw mm-hmm. an ending. Yeah. And that's what we're going to do here. Um, I know that if you keep doing endings, you can get like the true ending. Mm-hmm. We might talk about that, but we ain't doing it. I'm going to YouTube mode and wiki mode those. I yeah. think yeah. I'm not putting 60 hours into, into this. I like Hades a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, it's real fun and, yeah. and it is better for the structure than some roguelikes. It's got a lot of narrative and character and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, going to be real fun to talk about. Uh, I don't like it enough to be completionist about it. Yes. So yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, that's going to be a premium episode. Oh, good. Sorry. I was going to say also, uh, just while we're telling you to mark your calendars, uh, December 17th, mm-hmm. that weekend, Duckstream. Uh, yeah, baby. Time to uh, announce. It, yeah. So December, uh, Dece- the weekend of Dece- December 17th, uh, 48 hours. Yeah. 48 hours yeah. of, uh, of video game streaming to benefit the transactive gender project out of, um, uh, what is that? Um, Lewis the and Explorer Clark. guys, Lewis and Clark college. Yeah. The Explorer uh, this, guys. Yeah. The Explorer guys. Uh, we're coming up on about 10 years of doing this. Yeah. A a decade of excellence. Yeah. Uh, it's gonna be real fun. We're doing the same format we've done for the last couple of years where we do nights on the West coast and days in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. Uh, the days of doing this for 24 hours straight are over. Thank God. (laughs) I I won't live Mm -hmm. if we do that. Um, we got a lot of fun stuff planned. Um, stay tuned. For more about uh, scheduling and more specific things, just know now that is the weekend to mark off, mm-hmm. you know, starting at 6 p.m. again. Yes. You know, uh, 48 hours. Yeah. More details as we get closer. Yep. Uh, in terms of a highlight project, if you are listening to this and you are a non-cis, straight, white man and you have a project you'd like us to highlight, please send me an email at gary at duckfeed.tv. Um, for a while that hopper was dry and now my cup runneth over. Mm. So if you've sent in a thing and you don't hear anything for a while, um, we, I haven't forgotten about you. Mm. Um, and there's a nice little bit of synergy. Uh, the one that I would like to call out uh, today, this is, it's kind of a cheat, but it's also drawing some attention. So my, uh, friend Allison and her friends, uh, do a podcast called Waystar Corncob, which is a mashup podcast of, I think you should leave and succession. Okay. Uh, which what? sound like they, the, the, they don't sound like they should go together. The, their podcast presupposes what if they do. Okay. Uh, basically talking about both of those properties and drawing parallels between them. Okay. Uh, and I guessed it on an episode of this. Uh, I don't know succession. I haven't seen that, but I did talk about the uh, Tim Robinson episode of the characters. Okay. Which is a proto. I think you should leave. If you haven't watched that, that is uh Basically, oh, I think good. you should leave zero. Yeah. You know? Uh, so, yeah. So, I guess down that to talk about that, it's thus completing my pact to talk about every I think you should leave related thing on the network <laughs> somewhere. Uh, and it's a great podcast and they're great folk. Nice. Yeah. So, that's uh, that's Waystar Corncob. Uh, you can find them at Dennis Allison. That's uh, Allison with one L. Mm-hmm. Um, dot podbean.com. Cool. Yeah. Check it out. Nice. Um, what, what, what a concept, man, that, that character's episode is really good. It's great. It's like, it's like a secret, uh, you know, and we, we get into some good stuff and a good conversation about it because Mm -hmm. it's, it's really good. And it is, and I think you should leave zero. There's also Uh some, some things in it that kind of burn off. 
Mm-hmm. Like there's some kind of like low jokes, yeah. you know, like, like, like the, the thing with, uh, you know, good news, dad, mom's <laughs> live, bad news to the Raj king of the slams. Um, <laughs> there's like, they sneak in a little, you know, my uncle molested me joke in the middle of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you should leave doesn't do that stuff. Right. Like it generally stays away from that, but there's still a little bit of it. Yeah. In uh in the characters. And, and did did your did your lack of catalog on succession hurt you on that one or I didn't talk about succession. I think they split it into two episodes because we talked about uh the characters for a long time. Gotcha. Huh. Yeah. Uh but yeah, I wasn't gonna I was wasn't just gonna just sit back and listen to folk talk about a show that I kinda wanna watch that I haven't seen any episodes of. <laughs> uh so I think they split it. They might have also I might have just also been on the first segment. Gotcha. I haven't listened gotcha. to it yet because it just uploaded today. Yeah, yeah. Um or haven't checked it out yet. So mm-hmm. but yeah. Uh, and I would be, uh, giving them a shout out, even if I hadn't, hadn't guested. Nice. Uh, it is a good diverse crew of folk and, uh, doing cool, narrow casted work, which is a great idea for a podcast because, mm-hmm. uh, we got enough, just a couple of people talking about a thing. We do. You know? Yeah. Got a narrow cast. <laughs> cool. Um, um, uh, where, where can people send those if they would like to uh, get them on? Gary at duckfeed.tv. Cool. And again, I haven't missed yours. I have a bunch of them now in the backlog, so. Good problem to have. Absolutely. Um, if you want to support us, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash duckfeedtv. We appreciate your support very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you can also leave us a rating review on Apple Podcast or Podcast Addict, that also helps us quite a bit. Tell your friends and check out our other shows. Please do. Yeah, yeah. I think that's all the stuff. We You, you did all the stuff. Cool. Well, yeah. Um, we'll be back next week with uh, with Torment and Tides of Numenera. Umbasa. Boom, boss. Awesome.